Hello and welcome to Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily, the podcast that gives you everything you need to know about the day to come on the election trail. My name is Sam Coates of Sky News and with me is Jack Blankerhard. Well, I suppose that's what the Times calls you this morning, right? Of Politico. It's Thursday morning. It's day 15 of the election campaign and there are exactly four weeks to go until polling day. And it's also the first of four days of voting in the European Parliament elections. But that's not going to distract us. We're here to give you stuff about the British campaign, the UK campaign. So there are smaller agenda items today because the world descends on Normandy to commemorate D-Day. Jack, what's going on this morning? Yeah, it's D-Day in France, Sam, but it's very much tax day here again. The conversation is going to be dominated once again by those Tory charges about Labour supposedly raising your taxes and about Labour's pretty angry response to that. That's the big thing. There's also the second thing is the final throws of the manifestos are being nailed down as well as the candidate lists. They get signed off tomorrow. The manifestos are being launched next week. And it's another big day in Welsh politics as well. And we'll be asking what's next for Vaughan Gething after he lost that vote of no confidence in the Senate last night. Should we just talk briefly about D-Day, Sam? It is going to dominate the news coverage today. It is 80 years to the day since the invasion of Normandy, of course, which changed the course of World War II. And we're going to see Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, alongside President Joe Biden, President Emmanuel Macron, loads of others at these solemn ceremonies in France today. My Politico colleague Dan Bloom's reporting in Playbook that Sunak's coming home early, however, to get straight back to his election war room as quick as he can this afternoon, which maybe gives you a sense of where the Prime Minister's priorities are today. I mean, he is 25 points behind it in the polls so you know maybe that's not a bad idea that's right look the campaign buses are parked official campaigning is suspended uh, and it's wall-to-wall d-day on sky i'm told Um, but while the events have stopped clearly the briefings haven't sort of first out the traps this morning is jeremy hunt the conservatives are trying to build on what they perceive was success in tuesday night's itv head-to-head debate landing a message about tax Um, And this morning, Jeremy Hunt is giving interviews all over the place and writing articles. The Telegraph majors on his promise of a what he calls family home tax guarantee. So you remember last week, the parties were ruling out income tax, national insurance, corporation tax and VAT rises. Well, today, Jeremy Hunt goes even further. uh, No increases to capital gains tax, specifically on your main home when it's sold, to the rate or the level of stamp duty, uh, or to council tax bans, or they're ruling out any kind of revaluation. So he's going further. Labour aren't matching that uh, this morning. They just uh, fall back on their broader promise not to raise uh, taxes uh, on working people, which is obviously uh, a slightly ill-defined promise. But it is their attempt to smoke out Labour's position. Uh, What do we make of this? Well, it's been fascinating watching Labour trying to respond to this, Sam. You could see them panicking in real time on Tuesday night, couldn't you? If you were watching your Twitter feed as the debate was going on, you could see all these Labour big hitters coming out, shouting, no, no, this tax attack is not true, saying the things that you could see. They were clearly desperately wishing Keir Starmer would say on TV, which he, you know, failed to do repeatedly and eventually got there at the end of the debate far too late, um, as we were saying yesterday. By Wednesday morning, yesterday morning, Labour had a plan and that was to come out very, very hard against this. And we saw everybody who matters in the Labour Party calling Rishi Sunak a liar. That is not a word you hear banded around very often directly at opponents, but Labour are choosing to deploy it now in a very, very Uh, hard-hitting way and and I think we're going to hear that framing about Rishi Sunak now given that the Tories have decided to go so hard on these tax attacks which Labour say are not true. Um, It'd be interesting to see which has more traction really. I mean you know Labour is obviously a party that is associated with tax rises. The Tories have successfully branded them that way for decades but equally trust in politicians is through the floor. This is not a prime minister who is well liked by the country. All the opinion poll ratings will tell you that and so I do wonder if the sort of he's just a liar attack will also be quite an effective one. I mean this really is campaigning in primary colours, isn't it, Sam? These are pretty basic level, they're going to raise your taxes, he's a liar. It's not exactly the nuanced debate the country is uh, perhaps crying out for, but, you know, we're two weeks in and this is where it's at. It's interesting which of two different techniques work better. There's either that one, the lawyer one, the liar one, or there's the one that I wonder whether it's more effective, which is uh, just to draw comparisons with various Tory claims promises uh, and what's been going on. Very struck that the spectator used the same methodology to calculate the kind of 
black hole and the cost per household of Tory promises and came out with a figure of 3,000, even higher than the 2,000 that they accuse uh, Labour of planning to levy uh, on households. Um, but there was a great stat from Skinner's Ed Conway yesterday, um, who, using the same technique, uh, said that taxes had gone up in the parliament that's just ended by £13,000. Uh, so um, whether or not you just call each other, uh, uh, say each other's pants are on fire, or whether or not you uh, draw some comparisons, uh, it, it, it's a complex picture, I think. Um, but the job of the Tory party, I think at the moment, they feel is to push Labour on lots of specifics. Um, interestingly, they were also doing that on pension savings and uh, suggestions that Labour might tax the save pension savings of higher earners. Again, Rachel Reeves refused to categorically rule it out. She used that vague, possibly meaningless formulation that she's got no plans to do so. But in the end, lots of experts think the next parliament is going to be about raising taxes yet higher because of problems with the public services, because of the squeeze that's penciled into the, uh, to the finances. Uh, and uh, so while rhetoric, campaign rhetoric, uh, about themselves is about lowering tax. Uh, the reality is watching for what people rule out uh, in when it comes to raising tax, because that's just the, the the more likely reality. Yeah, totally agree with that. The other thing to say, of course, is that public only sort of semi listening to any of this, and you do have to repeat your campaign messages a billion times for them to actually start landing in normal people's brains. Uh, which is why you will hear these two attack lines about Labour's secret tax rises and the Prime Minister being a liar again and again and again for the next four weeks. And sorry about that, but we're going to have to keep talking to them uh, about them a bit more. Should, should, should we talk about the the candidates and the manifesto, sir, because um, the sort of the mechanics of the election are getting finalised this week, aren't they? Um, the Labour NEC meets tomorrow, Friday, with the NEC and friends, union leaders and others, like all the big hitters in the Labour movement get together for what's called a Clause 5 meeting where they sign off the manifesto. So the Labour Party manifesto has to be finalised by tonight so they can print it out on secret bits of paper and agree it tomorrow and they will launch it next week. Um, the Tory party does not go through such a strange process but it is nonetheless also finalizing its manifesto this week to launch next week we understand and at the same time the candidates list the final list of people who are standing in this general election is going to be officially submitted and signed off by all parties on friday afternoon as well so we're seeing the final machinations of this process that has been going on the past couple of weeks of people being parachuted into safe seats or chucked out of safe seats at the last minute uh, that's been ongoing um what's the latest on that sam well, you've got one Tory MP who about whom there were lots of rumours uh, that uh, he might defect. Tom Hunt uh, defect to reform, uh, shutting that rumour down. So he's going to stay as a Tory candidate. Everybody's favourite ex-Tory MP, uh, Rick Holden, the Conservative Party chairman, has found a seat. Amazing, the Conservative Party chairman managed to find a seat. He's now going to try and be elected as the MP for Basildon, uh, which is a very long way away from his uh, uh, from his northeast uh, seat in the last parliament. He was a Red Wall champion. Uh, he's about to become an Essex champion. Uh, nothing to see there uh, at all. <laughs> I think it's worth just saying how much anger this process has continued to cause within the Tory party. We talked a lot earlier in the week about the anger within the Labour Party, about the parachuting in of, Rich, of uh, Keir Starmer's pals and the, the, the barring of certain left-wing candidates from seats. Well, the, the same process, this messy process has been going on to a degree within the Tory party. And here's Rick Holden being parachuted into this seat in Essex where no other contenders were allowed on the shortlist. So with a shortlist of one, even Rick Holden can win that contest. And uh, we've seen it with uh, others as well. Will Tanner, uh, Richard Sunak's deputy chief of staff, has found himself a seat. And, you know, there have been others like that, too. And it makes a lot of Tories, especially grassroots Tories, the people you want out campaigning for you in these crucial weeks, extremely angry and unhappy with their own party, which is never a good thing when you're trying to galvanise the troops. Congratulations to you, Jack. You've you've done better than us, better than me. Uh, at the moment, I can't even nail down that the Tory manifesto is next week. The Labour one, as you say, on Thursday. But the Tories, the, the G7, Seven that Rishi Sunak's going to is Thursday and Friday. There's the Sky event uh, with Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer on Wednesday night. So could it be uh, that the Tories actually launch their manifesto very early next week or, or does it slip to the following week? I, I, I haven't been able to, to, to nail that down. Um, one manifesto drop uh, uh, that the Times thinks it's got hold of uh, is uh, that the uh, 
Tory party will promise to increase uh, the minimum sentence for murderers from 15 to 25 years and introduce a, a US style distinction between first and second degree killings uh, and de uh, first and second degree murder the party haven't confirmed this story but but as we get closer to the manifesto launch uh, we're going to get more of that unclear what the impact will be on prison places it's pretty clear that what they're trying to signal there sam given this is a toy party that only a few weeks ago was letting prisoners out of prison early left right and center and getting lots and lots of stick for it from on the right so once again assuming this policy is confirmed in the manifesto and no reason to doubt the times um just desperately trying to signal to you know more conservative voters no 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 we really do like locking people up honest honest look we really do uh despite all the evidence uh, to the contrary of late Shall we just move very quickly on to Wales? That turned out to be a humdinger of a vote yesterday. Vaughan Gething, the first minister, lost a vote of no confidence because two members of the Welsh Senate didn't vote. Both of them just happened uh, to have criticised him in the past, although they claim, uh, although there are reports that they were ill. Um, and of course, that means because the Senate is split 30-30, uh, he lost uh, he says he's going to carry on. Jack, is that the end of the matter? I very much doubt it. The the, the history of losing votes of confidence uh, for leaders is that uh, they do not tend to carry on very long. It was not a binding vote, so he literally can carry on. He is carrying on. In fact, he's off to the, the D-Day commemorations today as Wales' as first minister, as, as he should be. Um, but the pressure on him, both within and without his party, is now enormous and it is not going to go away. And if you talk to people... Uh, in Welsh politics, very few of them think he is very long for this world now. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, there's a general election a few weeks away. Um, but after that, is he really going to survive in the long term in the way that he would have hoped? It doesn't feel like it, does it? And uh, once again, Sam, we made the point the other day, but the longevity of our political leaders seems to have just collapsed over the last few years. You know, you used to think you'd got, become a leader, you'd be in it for at least five, six, seven years these days, you know. He's, he's on course to do a truss at this rate, isn't he? Absolutely. So listening to Labour shadow cabinet members, they clearly don't want this kind of turmoil uh, disrupting their Ming Vars election campaign. That's pretty much it. It's a quite a day on the election trail. So we will give you a bit back more of your day. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Thanks very much.